Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Jim Fitzpatrick. He is a young man who lives and works in Dublin. And um, he is a graphic artist, he's an illustrator, and he has made his own thing of illustrating Irish mythology and folklore in a most unusual and extraordinary way. So much so that a month ago, at a dinner in San Diego in California, in before 1,500 people at the banquet, he was awarded the United States Ink Pot Award for 1981 for his outstanding achievement in illustration. Hi, can I have one or two of those? Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Uh, did this come as a surprise to you, this... Um... A shock, I think, is the word a for it. A shock. I was sitting there watching all these people who are my heroes in many ways getting these awards. Yeah. And uh, suddenly they sort of said, and now we come to a man who's come 7,000 miles all the way from Ireland. And myself and Deirdre, my wife, who was with me, looked at each other thinking, who else is here from Dublin? Yeah. <laughs> we and looked around, I and the spotlight swung on me, and I sat there thinking, you know, this is a mistake. And eventually I just, you know, copped on. What are we looking at right way. now? Uh, uh, no, we're looking at a close-up of a painting called The Battle of Moira. This is uh, one of the prints in a new portfolio I've out. That's, uh, the, that's the background. This is the uh, army's massing. Yes. This was a great battle fought in Moira in Ulster. And it was the last sort of, uh, what you call the last stand of the pagan Ulster men against uh, the Christian uh, <coughs> Southerners. Yeah. It was a momentous event in itself. That's Congo. There was a great poem written about this by uh, Sir Samuel Ferguson. How did Congo. you, how did you, Jim, get first hooked on Irish mythology and folklore <clears throat> in this way? I mean, it's an extraordinary oh, thing. Uh, when I it was a kid, from? I used to spend an awful lot of my time uh, listening to this type of story. Now, <laughs> I used to go on my holidays down to County Clare. Mm. I have relatives down there. And uh, we used to have a, a man called a Shanaki. Now, he wasn't called the Shanaki as such, but he was the storyteller. And there was no television in those days, you know, barely had wireless. Couldn't <laughs> possibly think about it, I asked. Seriously, I'm not joking. <laughs> and uh, we used to sit around the fireplace and listen to this man tell tales. And he always spoke of the mystical Tua de Danon. And they were the fairy folk, you know. And the uh, ethos of that is so strong there that they would leave milk out at night for the fairy folk on certain nights. And I was totally enveloped in this sort of mystical subculture. And I was absolutely interested in it. And I resolved, even then, I was on, this is about sort of when I was eight or nine, that I was going to do something with all that material. Because I went to my history books in school, and that is, you know, primary school. And uh, there was about one chapter on the whole subject. You know, and, and you the two of they denon were two lines. Yes, and you started. I wanted to know everything about yeah. them. You know, yeah. And so I thought, well, if I'm interested, you know, somebody when else. When I got older, I want right. to get other people interested right. in them. You know? What is this one then? This is uh, Lou attacking the former armies. Lou was uh, the, probably the greatest hero with Nuad of the Silver Arm of the two of they denon. You're seeing the foreground uh, of the picture, which is the former armies massed and coming towards them on this wild uh, horse is Lou, Lou of the Long Arm. And the brilliance behind them, it looks a bit flashy, but it has its purpose. Uh, when the bat just before the battle begun, uh, Brass the Beautiful, who is the great uh, uh, leader of the Formor, looked up to the uh, west and said, it's a strange day today, the sun has risen in the west. And th he asked his druids, what was the meaning of this omen? And the druid said to him, it's a nil omen, it is the radiance of a warrior without equal. And with this, came in a blinding flash towards and I've tried to capture the essence of that piece of the story in it. The ex what gets me is the extraordinary intricacies of the of the drawings, Jim. Oh, that's just my mad mind. <laughs> yeah, is, is that with a very fine pen? Oh, or? it is. It's almost with a mapping pen. And uh, I'm trying to sort of... You can't really see it from these two uh, particular paintings, but I'm trying to get back to the intricacy of the original illuminations in the Book of Kells, which I'm obviously yeah. highly influenced by, you know? Yeah, they're, they're, they are almost trying to get Book of Kells-y yeah, type But I'm also trying to get something of the sort of power of the legends, because the legends themselves are marvellously powerful stories, and I translate them from the original Gaelic, yeah. and then I put them into pictures, and then... You know, I write scripts, you might say, to go with them. Just let's have a look at this <coughs> third one now. What is this one? This yeah, very, I'm glad you picked this. This is very one, of my, one of my favourite ones. It's probably very hard for anybody to see. This is an illustration, again, it's from the portfolio, and uh, it tells the story of Airy, who is one of the princesses of the Tua de Danon. 
and uh, the man she's with, if you can see him on the couch there, and behind is a stained glass window, and through that is his ship. This was the story of the son of the king of the Fomor, who came to Airy, and it's a beautifully romantic story of the man coming sailing on a ship of silver across this golden seas, all this sort of stuff. You <laughs> you're <know>? really <laughs> sold on this, aren't you? You're, I love you're, get, it. I you're getting sent by. Now, how stuff, long would it take you to finish completely that picture? That picture now took me a bit longer than, it, than they usually take. That's, you're talking about six weeks of non stop work. Now, I work in the morning, I work in the evening, and you know, when at night when I'm downstairs in, with the family, I have a desk in the family room and I'm working away on this and I find that that's the best way to work because all mean, the creative work is done during the day. Do you, you mean know? that particular picture would take you six weeks? That particular picture would take me six weeks. Yeah. Yeah, if you even look at the borders, they've taken, you know, they're all very intricate. They are very Book of Kells, right enough. Oh, yes, they're totally can... influenced by the Book of Kells. I make no bones about I, it. Well, yeah. I never knew, <clears throat> which shows the depths of my ignorance, I never knew until this week that you were responsible for that post of Che Guevara. I beg your pardon. No, that's Sorry, Mike. back to uh, 1968. That's when I started. You're looking at one of the very first things I ever did in this sort of line. I've done an awful lot of posters of Celtic mythology, goddesses and everything, but I started and I think I was the very first poster artist per se who decided he was going to do a poster and sell it. And this was the one I did. And I'll tell you how that came about. This was just before Che Guevara was uh, killed in Bolivia. And uh, I don't want to go into the whole story of it, but I'd met him briefly in Kilkee. You met yeah. Che Guevara? Oh, seriously, yeah, absolutely. In Turkey? When I was about 14. It sounds like a tall tale, right? <laughs> did any of you know that Che Guevara was in Kilkee ever? You didn't, did you? You're not, you're not kidding, oh, sir. No, not at all. This all is right. absolutely true. You can check it out. I was working uh, as a barman in a hotel in the Royal Marine. We were going on a pilgrimage to Rome, right? But uh, the college, I was in Gormson College, told us we had to work our own way. We had to earn our own money. So we got us all summer jobs. And I was working at the age of about 14 in this bar. This is about 1961, I think. And I was sitting in this bar, and I swear to God, in walked Che Guevara with two bodyguards. Now, I, at that time, the Cuban Revolution was relatively fresh. And I, I was an absolute hero, sorry, an absolute idolizer of uh, people like Fidel Castro, who had fought against Batista and Che Guevara and Camille Cienfuegos and all the great Cuban leaders. And I recognized this man immediately, you know, and I couldn't believe it. And the guys came over and ordered drinks. So I sort of looked at him and I said, excuse me, you know, are you Che Guevara, you know? And the again, same, the same, the man same. it was, yeah. Yes. And he gave me a, a banknote, which I don't have, but I tell you something, on the banknote was his signature. You know the way Mr. Whitaker signs our banknotes? It said, Che, C-H-E. And all Cuban banknotes were signed like I that. I thought for a moment you were going to say it was signed Che, S-H-A-Y. No, I don't. <laughs> I tell yeah. you, he had an Irish grandfather. A grandmother, grandmother, sorry, named Lynch from County Cork. Oh, it would be Lynch from <laughs> County Cork. Oh, that, that doesn't surprise me in the least. That's another piece of information. But that's, that's absolutely true as well. Oh, dear, and, that's why you, and that post has gone all around the world now. And from that moment on, this, I always sort of watched everything this man, uh, followed everything he did. And when he went to Bolivia, I figured, well, this is the end of him. You know, it was pretty obvious he was going there to die. And I did this poster for a magazine called Scene Magazine, which was running at the time. Mm. And uh, they wouldn't run it because it had sort of controversial overtones. I mean, he was a communist and he was a Catholic in the two you know, or taboo at the time, certainly. And uh, I did this poster, I sent it to Private Eye. It went on an exhibition that went all over Europe, and uh, I produced a poster of myself, hawked it around the shops here, myself and Deirdre took a stall in the Dandelion Market. We sold it there, really. <laughs> <laughs> Things you have to do there in a living as an artist. You know? <laughs> and it's been, it's been ripped off so many times that I don't even recognize it now, you know? There's another one there, have a quick look on the back, which is another version, which I prefer oh, myself. Oh, that's yes, mine as well. The darker you know? one, yes, yeah. yes. I like well, that one because it, yeah, it's yeah. all on metallic silver yeah. and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. I did a couple of versions of it, you know. Yeah. But you see, you see it in the strangest place. I met one of your staff, actually, who came back from Cuba there about uh, six months ago. Yeah. And he told me I was big in Cuba. <laughs> which one Small in Ireland, I big in Cuba. I would refer to him as one of my staff had been in Cuba. I reflects you, I ill upon me. Oh, wouldn't like, listen, you're a lovely man, Jim Fitzpatrick, and I wish you the very best of luck with your new portfolio. Isn't it nice stuff? Isn't it nice?